Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 17. So let's get started. So the first question, a 38 year old female presents to you with frequent headaches and a history of multiple DVT and two spontaneous abortions. Her peripheral smear is as shown in the image below. What is the probable diagnosis? A. ITP B. Acute myeloid leukemia C. Essential thrombocytosis or D. Protein C. Deficiency So pause, think and then we'll discuss. So here you have a female who comes to you with headaches but more importantly history of multiple DVT and two spontaneous abortions. So whenever you see such a thread, especially multiple DVT, you should always start thinking about some hypercoagulable state or some pro-thrombotic state. So keeping that in mind, let's look at the options. So the first option was A, ITP. So as you all know, ITP is a condition where there is immune mediated destruction of platelets in the periphery and you have thrombocytopenia and this usually presents with mucocutaneous bleeding disorders like petechiae, ecchymosis, gum bleeding, or even nosebleeds. So here, none of, a, none of that matches with the history, so we can confidently rule out ITP. Now let's look at option B, AML. So AML, or acute myeloid leukemia, is a malignancy of the cells of the myeloid lineage or the, a malignancy of the WBCs, right? So here, this is usually accompanied with, again, thrombocytopenia, okay, thrombocytopenia. So you'll have, again, mucocutaneous bleeding disorders doesn't really match up with the history. Now let's look at option C, essential thrombocytosis. So essential thrombocytosis is a condition where you have increased production of thrombocytes by the bone marrow. It's a myeloproliferative disorder where there is increased production of platelets by the bone marrow. So yes, there is, thro there is thrombosis or there is a pro-thrombotic state here. So we should definitely consider C. Now let's look at option D, protein C deficiency. So as you all know, protein C deficiency and protein S deficiency are both hypercoagulable states. So definitely that could also be the answer. So our doubt is between C and D. And that's where this peripheral smear comes into play. So let's look at the peripheral smear. So here you see a lot of platelets, more than normal. So you see a lot of platelets and some large irregular platelets. So increased platelets or thrombocytosis with large irregular platelets on peripheral smear is indicative of essential thrombocytosis. So the answer here is C essential thrombocytosis and we made the diagnosis mainly based on the peripheral smear. So this is not something that we really study or read well during our UG days and therefore let's discuss it in some detail today and it is fairly high yield. So essential thrombocytosis or essential thrombocythemia as it's also called is a myeloproliferative disorder in which there is increased production of platelets by the bone marrow. And this happens or this increased production of platelets usually happens due to a mutation in a gene called the Janus kinase 2 gene. So Janus kinase 2 gene or the JAK2 gene. So the most high yield thing I'll be talking from this topic today is about the JAK2 gene. So remember, mutations in the JAK2 gene are associated with essential thrombocytosis or rather ET is associated with JAK2 mutations. Now let's talk a little bit about the pathogenesis. And before we go to the pathogenesis, a little review of physiology. So normally in our body, all the cells of the blood originate from the hematopoietic stem cells, right? So these hematopoietic stem cells give rise to RBCs, give rise to WBCs, and give rise to the platelets under different factors or under the influence of different factors. So when erythropoietin acts on these hematopoietic stem cells, they give rise to erythrocytes or RBCs. Similarly, there's a hormone called thrombopoietin. And when thrombopoietin acts on these cells, they give rise to megakaryocytes, which then give rise to platelets. So here you have thrombopoietin, which is a hormone primarily secreted by the liver and also by the kidneys. And this thrombopoietin then goes and binds to the receptors or the thrombopoietin receptors on the membrane of the hematopoietic stem cells. So thrombopoietin produced by the liver and kidneys bind to the thrombopoietin receptors 
present on the hematopoietic cells or present in the hematopoietic cells and when thrombopoietin binds to the cells that leads to activation of the JAK2 gene okay so when thrombopoietin binds to these these this binding of thrombopoietin leads to activation of something called the JAK2 gene and then this JAK2 gene is responsible for the conversion of a hematopoietic stem cell into a megakaryocyte which then gives you platelets so in essential thrombocytosis this JAK2 gene is mutated so remember here the JAK2 gene is mutated and when the JAK2 gene is mutated irrespective of thrombopoietin stimulating or not it starts to convert the hematopoietic stem cells into megakaryocytes or platelets so irrespective of the same stimulus there is conversion of hematopoietic stem cells into megakaryocytes so you will have an increased number of megakaryocytes so your bone marrow will be filled with megakaryocytes because all your hematopoietic cells start becoming megakaryocytes and then you will have an increased platelets and this condition is called essential thrombocytosis and it can be also this is a little high yield or trivial point it can also happen sometimes due to mutations in the thrombopoietin receptor or even in a protein called the cal reticulum protein or the cal r protein but not too important remember there is a jak2 mutation and when jak2 is mutated hematopoietic stem cells stem cells are converted into megakaryocytes which then leads to increased platelets which then lead to essential thrombocytosis so now we have increased platelets and what all can these increased platelets lead to so these increased platelets can lead to dvt in the lower limbs right again pro thrombotic state it can lead to pulmonary thromboembolisms it can lead to strokes if it forms in the brain it can lead to mi if it forms in the or myocardial infarction if it forms in the coronaries it can lead to multiple abortions so always rule out et when you have multiple abortions okay and it can also sometimes lead to gout because of the increased cell turnover turnover in these conditions and just like all your hypercellular marrow conditions it's more common in elderly and there is a hype or sorry just like all your myeloproliferative disorders it's more common in the elderly and it is more or it presents with a hypercellular bone marrow so all your myeloproliferative disorders more common in elderly and presents with the hypercellular bone marrow a little note this question had a 38 year old woman so remember et has a second peak so it's more common in elderly but then it can also be seen in younger women so that was about the pathogenesis of et and the different complications that it can lead to another small point sometimes when the platelet count is more than 15 lakhs or 1.5 million it can also lead to bleeding disorders why because when there are so many platelets in circulation they start using up the von willebrand's von willebrand's factor vvf von willebrand's factor present in the blood and in the tissues and that leads to a decrease in von willebrand factor and then bleeding disorder so increased platelets start using the free von willebrand factor available and that leads to bleeding so remember when the it could also present with bleeding manifestations if the platelet count is more than 1.5 million or 15 lakh okay and usually all your myeloproliferative disorders will have vague symptoms like headache nausea vomiting tinnitus fatigue and dizziness headache nausea vomiting tinnitus fatigue and dizziness because there is hyper viscosity of blood so all these are because of hyper viscosity of blood but in essential thrombocytosis the hyper viscosity is not too much and usually it's just an incidental finding when they do some other routine examination now let's talk about diagnosis so the first thing i want you to remember is that essential thrombocytosis is a diagnosis of exclusion you can only say that there is essential thrombocytosis after you've ruled out every other cause of thrombocytosis the common causes being iron deficiency anemia infections post surgery some inflammation so these are some of the causes that can lead to and post splenectomy also so these are some of the causes that can lead to thrombocytosis so only after ruling out all of these would you consider an essential thrombocytosis and what would your labs show firstly your cbc will show thrombocytopenia peripheral smear will show thrombocytosis and large irregular thrombocytes like i showed you earlier and your bone marrow biopsy like all myeloproliferative disorders is hypercellular and there will be an increase in the megakaryocyte so you can see here there is increase in platelets and more importantly there is an increase of megakaryocytes in the bone marrow and i have showed that here this is 
a very important point your thrombopoietin is actually reduced because there's an increase in the platelets so there's down regulation of negative feedback so thrombopoietin is reduced bleeding time is increased plus pt aptt are normal remember pt aptt affected only in clotting factor diseases so bleeding time is increased but pt aptt are normal and you can also do a genetic test for the jack 2 mutation so how do you manage essential thrombocytosis remember you give antiplatelet drugs in low risk cases so in most cases are low risk cases especially youngsters with no other history of uh, bleeding uh, or clotting or prothrombotic disorders you just give aspirin low dose aspirin is given but in high risk patients those are high risk are those who are elderly and with those of previous history of thromboembolic events for them you will give drugs that reduce the platelet count so three important drugs that reduce the platelet count hydroxyurea interferon alpha and enigrelide so enigrelide is a very important drug it's, it was asked a few years back so enigrelide reduces the platelet count by preventing megakaryocyte formation okay so enigrelide is one drug so hydroxyurea interferon alpha and enigrelide are important other than that if the patient has to undergo some kind of surgery or there is some emergency you can also do platelet pheresis just like plasma pheresis you remove platelets from the body right and complication of essential thrombocytosis is malignant transformation it can lead to formation of aml or it can lead to development of acute myeloid leukemia or even myelofibrosis so that was about essential thrombocytosis not fairly important topic but not the most important if i want you to just remember one thing it is a jack 2 mutation now let's go to the next question next two questions are very easy questions so what is the most common form of arthritis a rheumatoid arthritis b zero negative arthritis c septic arthritis or d osteoarthritis so pause think then we'll discuss so the answer here is very obvious d osteoarthritis the reason i included this is because 50 percent of the people answered it as rheumatoid arthritis so although we study rheumatoid arthritis a lot more remember osteoarthritis is far more common and 75 percent of people who cross the age of 75 are prone to developing osteoarthritis so 75 percent of people who cross the age of 75 so osteoarthritis is far more common than rheumatoid arthritis so no controversy on that now let's talk a little bit about the joint distribution of osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis because it's fairly important for the exams so osteoarthritis usually presents with a large joint involvement usually they have knee or hip pain if the small joints are involved the dip that is the distal interphalangeal joint pip proximal interphalangeal joint and the mtp metatarsophalangeal joint all these small joints are involved so dip dip pip and mtp are involved but the wrist elbow are rarely involved okay the wrist elbow and ankle the wrist elbow and ankle not knee the wrist elbow and ankle are rarely involved okay whereas in rheumatoid arthritis very important remember the dip is not involved so you have the pip you have the wrist and you have the metacarpophalangeal joints so pip proximal interphalangeal joint wrist and metacarpophalangeal joint but dip is rarely involved and remember osteoarthritis may be symmetrical or asymmetrical but rheumatoid arthritis is always symmetrical so this is an interesting image i found online i hope you guys screenshot this okay which depicts very nicely the difference between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis so osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease in which you have reduced space in the cartilage and i've added this image here this image was not part of the original question it's a complete giveaway so you can see a reduced joint space so you have cartilage degeneration and erosion of the cartilage so cartilage loss whereas rheumatoid arthritis is due to an autoimmune disease and there is immune mediated inflammation to the synovium and immune mediated damage to the joints okay and usually osteoarthritis presents with morning stiffness but lasting less than 30 minutes whereas rheumatoid arthritis presents with morning stiffness which lasts for much longer than 30 minutes osteoarthritis is usually asymmetrical whereas rheumatoid arthritis is always 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 symmetrical and associated with some other extra articular manifestations can also have other symptoms okay and now let's look at the joints here you can see here both the distal interphalangeal joint and the proximal interphalangeal joint both are involved okay so very important and when the dip is involved it or the inflammation of the dip presents with something called herbidens nodules so you'll have some inflamed joint here the dip is inflamed and that is called herbidens nodules and that is classical for osteoarthritis again you can see the large joints are involved like the knee like the hip 
okay and here also the mtp is involved spine also may be involved now let's look at rheumatoid arthritis firstly it's symmetrical secondly the dip is spared okay but the pip the mcp and the wrist are involved you can see osteoarthritis never involve the elbow right you can see here it's not involve the elbow neither has it involve the wrist whereas here the wrist and the elbow are involved so usually if the elbow elbow is involved and you are, you have a doubt remember elbow is not involved in osteoarthritis but involved in rheumatoid arthritis so everything other than the dip can be involved in rheumatoid arthritis hip and spine are very rare so everything other than the dip hip and spine rheumatoid arthritis and the rest here you can just look at the picture and uh, you know clear this for yourselves so let's move to the next question third question for today which of the following skeletal muscle relaxants is the safest to give for patients with liver failure a pancuronium b atracurium c rocuronium or d vecuronium so pause think and then we'll discuss so there's not much to discuss here but it's a very high yield point and this question has been asked many times and the answer is b atracurium so atracurium is very safe to give in liver disease and why because it goes or it undergoes something called hoffman elimination so two important drugs that undergo hoffman elimination are atracurium and cis atracurium so both are the same so or both have similar names rather just modifications of each other so remember hoffman elimination is under, or atracurium undergoes hoffman elimination what is hoffman elimination it is a spontaneous non enzymatic degradation of the drug in plasma so in the plasma itself the drug gets degraded so it has a half life and it's completely degraded in the plasma it does not need to be metabolized anywhere else in the body whereas all your curoniums remember all curoniums are steroid based drugs okay all curoniums are steroid based drugs and so rocuronium vecuronium pancuronium they are all steroid based and they are they are never given in liver failure okay they are never given in liver failure because they are metabolized in the liver whereas atracurium undergoes off pen elimination and therefore it is a drug of choice in liver failure because it's degraded in the plasma so one point to remember very high yield point atracurium undergoes hoffman elimination and the skeletal muscle relaxant of choice in a liver failure patient is atracurium so that's it for today thank you and we will see each other in discussion number 18